Ini we katoa na mihi ke koto, i rau rangatira ma tina koto, i tiwi tona i tina ko, tina ra, tina koto katoa. I do acknowledge uh, our treaty partner and Aotearoa and this phenomenal country that they came to 800 years ago that must have been the most incredible place on earth. You know, you imagine getting out of the walker and this place was teeming with invertebrates. This place had the highest number of vertebrates on the planet. Um, so the whole forest would have been alive. Uh, and I, I do want to talk about the challenge that New Zealand faces and the time we're in, because I think we're at a, a, a real, really interesting point in time. Um, New Zealand had a massive transition in 1984, and I think we're due for one now. And, and I really think it's about, it's no longer about the economy and the environment, it's about the environment and the economy. And I think that we will see a transition where nature becomes the backbone of New Zealand. You know, we've been... We've, we've spoken for years about farming being the backbone of the New Zealand. I think we're seeing a transition to, to our natural resources are, are going to be at the heart of this economy and how we, how we restore them, how we treasure them, how we nurture them will, will be the gift we leave to, to future generations. But, but I want to go back to a, to a poem written by Rudyard Kipling about Auckland City in 1880 and it was, he, taught, he termed it the last, the loneliest, the, the loveliest. And at that time in 1880, Auckland City would have had phenomenal bird life. It would have had at Kōkāko, Kiwi, at, um, teeming with bellbirds and tui. This was just part of the DNA of, of our Aotearoa. And 1880 was also the, about the same time that European brought in stoats, weasels, ferrets. Because we'd, we'd tried this, you know, Māori had come here with, with conservation principles, you know, the first principle of Rahui, of how you, uh, you know, Maori didn't own the land, but European came in and decided you need to own the land. And, and Maori had a philosophy of, of you look after the land and you look after it. And we had this clash of, of creating what we call Little Britain, where we tried to recreate Great Britain by bringing out gorse and we brought out possums from Tasmania. They failed in 1836, then we got them back 10 years ago and got them really going. Then we brought in rabbits because we wanted fur. So we, this, you know, fur was a big industry at the time with fur seals, uh, rabbit fur, possum fur. Um, and then the rabbits just, just wrecked havoc right through central Otago. So then we, we had our first conservation debate in New Zealand in about 1880 uh, with the decision to build, bring in mustelids from, from Europe, which was stoats, rats and ferrets. And the science community really opposed the government um, bringing in these, these mustelids, but the farming community won and we brought them in. And within, we protected those species for nearly nine years and, and within eight years our forests went silent. And, and so we did this terrible damage to, to our, our natural ecosystems and what we're doing now is we're part of a movement trying to fix it all and, and it's, it's, it's connecting communities, it's inspirational and I'm up here to speak to Conservation Week tonight uh, because there's some really fascinating stuff happening in Auckland and right at the moment there's one of the most expensive, um, so, so you've probably heard of the, the Maori creation of New Zealand, I just want to take you into the, into the, science, the geolo geological creation because the last, the loveliest, loneliest is something we're very proud of as Kiwis. Um, you know, last discovered, loneliest place in the world, loveliest. And, and when these plates collided and, and we ended up with this amazing assemblage of, of nature, uh, Tuatara is the only living dinosaur on the planet 200 million years ago. And this land bridge existed that the species drifted off onto Aotearoa 60 million years ago. Our frogs are 70 million years old. They, they, they commute they, they, they uh, communicate through chemical secretions. Um, we've got a, a mesiptris, a little, um, uh, a little plant that grows on trees that's 80 million years old. And kiwi flew out of Antarctica probably 80 million years ago in the ratite. So we've got this, this phenomenal, um, you know, a country of birds. The mohua is the ancient lineage of all the, uh, the canaries in the world and, and the rock wren, our alpine rock wren, is the ancient lineage of all the wrens in the world. So, so we're a land of birds and what we're doing right at the moment is we're going to, and, and it, 
fascinatingly, it's funded by President Trump and Angela Merkel, and it's working off the coast. And we, the, the, we think New Zealand is sitting on the sixth continent, so we, we talk of the word Zealandia. And what they're doing at the moment with the International Ocean Drilling Project, and this is a $108 million project with a ship called the Geordies Resolution, is going into the edges of the plate boundaries to understand where New Zealand came from and, and created this continent, and did we actually go beneath the waves? Because the latest hypothesis is, is pieces clearly didn't. You know, when we look at this, this ancient, what we call ancient antiquity, the carry trees, you know, where did they come from if New Zealand's completely submerged? So President Trump and Angela Merkel are helping us an answer this question of what is the geologic origin of our nature and New Zealand, how we came out of Antarctica and how e we ended up with this tremendous assemblage of, of wildlife. Um, so, you know, we are a land of birds, we've got 93 endemics, we've got 198 birds, the UK has one endemic, so that's sort of why we value birds. Of the 12 albatross species, we've got eight. Of the 13 penguin species, we've got nine. There's 300 seabird species in the world. New Zealand has 25% of them. And on the Snares Island to the south of, uh, of Stewart Island, you can go there in a zodiac and watch five million titi or sooty shearwater coming in at night. And that's the more birds than the entire British Isles on one island, which is 250 hectares. So. You know, it, and you only need to go to Hotura Little Barrier to actually see what New Zealand was like and where we want to bring it back to. Snails, we're the second, you know, biggest country in the world for snails. There's one little gully in Tehiku, at uh, Tapaki, where you can put out your arm and there's 50 species of snails. So, you know, just, just think when that first walker arrived here what this place was. And we think we can get it back. Um, and, and what we're doing is we're a heart of a movement that wants to do this uh, and we think, you know, we've already restored Haturu, Motuehe, Motutapu, Tiritiri Matangi. Tiritiri Matangi is now the most popular tourist attraction in Auckland, day attraction, and, you know, it's literally booked out for people to actually go and have an encounter with birds. And we're going to join forces with Auckland City to do this and we're going to try and as we make more and more of these islands predator-free, we want to flow those birds through to the Hanuas, where we've done a joint 1080 operation with Auckland City. And we only launched predator-free in Auckland about uh, two months ago. I turned up to what we called the Pestival. Um, and we had 500 people. Each community group was only allowed three. And there's now 1,000 groups in Auckland. All, well, you know, this is about getting New Zealand back, backyard by backyard by backyard. We need one in five people in a community to keep a $12 trap set and get rid of that rat, get rid of that stoat, get rid of that possum, and we can actually take suburbs predator free. In Wellington, we've got 14,000 people. We've got, we had 500 people turned up to a predator free Brooklyn. I was at predator free Miramar uh, six weeks ago. Um, New World Supermarket was doing the barbecue, Mitre 10 was doing the, the stoat boxes, the local restaurant was doing Wellington on a plate, they had pest on a plate. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, I was, I, was, I was watching young mothers with a pram putting a stoat box on top of their pram and heading home and marking their house. And that's the sort of movement we want because we're actually, it, it's more than pest, it, we're building communities. Um, and, and people, you know, I, I met a, a, a Syrian person there who hardly spoke English, but had taken a, bought a, a house that was completely rat infested. Um, and, and joining the movement, you know, they were, they were a, a refugee into New Zealand and working out that this was part, you know, they could be part of a much bigger thing, which was predator free New Zealand, and we could clean up their place, which was totally infested with rats. So it's completely exceeded our ex expectations. Reconnecting Northland, where with um, Stephen Tyndall's put quite a lot of money into how we connect communities all the way up. We've got the highest Kiwi densities in New Zealand now at the Bay of Islands. We've got the four iwi in the far north, Tehiku, actually wanting to, to build a barrier uh, 
across Te Rirawairua, you're at Cape Rianga, North Cape, and, and create a whole new place up there because that's actually where we think is one of the places in New Zealand, as most of New Zealand sunk under the waves, we think that area is actually, it has the highest biodiversity in New Zealand. It's basically where we think so many of our plants came from, our, our species, that refuge was there. The other one was in the Manuhira Key near Alexandra where when early European farmers came, there were so many moa bones, they used moa bones to light fires. And it's, you know, it, it had eight species of moa in one valley and it's got the most uh, in numbers of indigenous fish in New Zealand. So there were these, and it's got our only mammal, which is a crocodile um, dinosaur down there. So another fascinating one in uh, Hawke's Bay, we've basically brought all our resources together. We've got 25,000 hectares of Hawke's Bay and a project called Cape to City at very, very low predator numbers. And on the Napier Taupo Road, the president of Federated Farmers used to see 100 possums a night. He now sees one possum a year. He spends $3,000 a year fixing his windows from Kereru flying into them. <laughs> and and he, he says, isn't that a much better problem to have? <laughs> and and he, you can actually see flocks of 100 kereru. And I was at Okarito. Okarito is a tiny town just north of, the, I'm from the Hokotika of the west coast, and I went down to see my mother recently, and I went to Okarito. There's, there's 15 people in the community there. They've invented their own stoat and rat box, and I saw flocks of 40 tui. Um, so, so it's community by community by community um, we, we're doing this. Rakiura, the, the guy that owns the, the, the Britain Norman Islander that flies the plane, he's, he's got 40 stoke boxes around his airfield. He's been doing it for 14 years. He now has enough kiwi coming out there that he can guarantee kiwi every night. And that's just one person uh, on an airfield. Uh, and and you can, he can, he's got a 99% guarantee of showing you a Kiwi going to his airfield. Uh, Mackenzie Basin, uh, we've just done, you know, 1080 does sit at the heart of this. We use a lot of 1080, we get a lot of opposition to it. We want something better. Uh, we don't want to always be using 1080, but we've done, just uh, near Haast, we've done a, a complete piece of land. We've done 10,000 hectares two pre-feeds, four kilos uh, per hectare of 1080, and in two months we haven't seen a single rat, a single possum, a single stoat. So if we could move beyond using 1080 after 1080, but actually say this is it, and we go pest free, and use our rivers as our boundaries, and start to really expand these landscapes, uh, that's really where we want to be. The Moriori Treaty Settlement on Chatham's uh, Maui Solomon, I met him the night they, they signed the, the deed of settlement and they'd had a, a, a pissed off uh, meal at their marae on the Chathams to celebrate the fact that we actually might be able to put some money together to make Chathams predator free and they had, uh, I think they had possum pies, they had um, swan um, sausages and they had weka samosas. Um, <laughs> But our treaty partner does sit at the heart of this and, and, and the last government did two remarkable things you know, with Tirawira and, and the Wanganui Awa, the river, where it actually turned the whole dial on you know, how we feel about parks and Tirawira was given its own entity. So it is a, it is a living person and it's not, it, the attitude of two Hoyas, we don't take from nature, we give to nature, we nurture nature and nature looks after us. And the same with Wanganui River when uh, Chris Finlinson announced that the Wanganui River has a, its own personality. What was remarkable is six weeks later the Indian government gave the same legal status to the Ganges, parts of the Ganges. So that was New Zealand leadership and, and now we are, we are relishing working with Wanganui I, Iwi and, and Tuhoi of how we, we bring that, that vision to life. Um, I'll just touch on, on a couple of other things. Uh, um, Joseph asked me to talk about freshwater and biosecurity. And in 1999, New Zealand Tourism launched its most successful marketing brand called 100% Pure. At the same time, there was an increasing interest in dairy. And in 1999, we had 4 million cows, and today we have 7 million cows. 
and each cow equates to about 14 humans in terms of urea and, and, and waste. Um, and our farms started going bigger, and, <coughs> and I think the tragedy we had was, was this was happening in our generation, is, is, is we could see that our fresh water was under threat um, with this increasing change to uh, uh, change of, of land use, um, and you know we got 40 species of native fish. Our most famous one is the anunga or, or, or the white bait and the longfin eels, but 75% of these these fish are threatened. Um, so, you know we've been working with Fonterra. They've given us 20 million to try and shift the dial to try and shift the. I think. What we need to do is shift our, we've treat, tended to treat our rivers as our back door, and we need to treat them as our front door. And I think what we need to do in New Zealand is create a movement similar to what we've done with Predator Free, where everybody is involved in restoring their bit of it and treating that awa as something really, really precious. And I think this election was about that. Uh, and I think whoever's government has that challenge because I think everybody f has felt the water issue has gone too far and we need to bring it back. On biosecurity, I think all this effort we're, we're putting into bringing back our nature is, is absolutely um, at risk if, if we allow our border uh, some of these insidious species like myrtle rust, like carry dieback, like um, great white butterfly, like rainbow skinks, Rainbow skinks, an Australian skink, our skinks breed annually. Australians breed five times a year. So you can see the potential we have for Australia to really nuke our, <laughs> our wildlife. And these rainbow skinks get around in containers. We've just found the first one in Picton. Uh, so we're going to go hard on Picton. Uh, we've got them on Great Barrier. They've come in through cargo ships into Auckland and sort of spread out from there. But like great white butterflies came into Nelson. We've, we've managed to deal to them. But myrtle rust is the one that really worries us. Um, it's come out of Brazil, into California, across to Hawaii, into Japan, then all through the eastern seaboard of Australia, and then it's blown into New Zealand through New Caledonia. Um, it was eradicated on Lord Howe Island. Currently, we've got it confined to Taranaki and Kerikeri, Keri, and we've found it on none of our natives, so it's, it's only in, in nursery stock. So. You know, th those issues of biosecurity are really important. And I guess climate change uh, was the last issue, and that is what's, what's happening as, as we've got the strongest westerlies we've ever seen. As the ozone hole over Antarctica is creating this differential uh, of heat going into Antarctica, the, the winds spinning around Antarctica are going faster and faster. The southern, southern Ocean is getting rougher. That's drawing the warm water out of the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So our whole climate systems have moved about 500 miles to the south. If you go to Australia, those climate systems, the warming of seawater has completely nuked the Tasmanian uh, Davilia and kelp forests. So they're losing great ecosystems in terms of, and you're getting the migration of South Australia species into Tasmania. The impacts aren't as great in New Zealand as yet, but the area that really worries us most is, is the area from Pusica around to Banks Peninsula. Increasing numbers of great white sharks, yellow white penguin in trouble. New Zealand sea lion doing okay, but we're seeing a sort of a retreat back to the sub-Antarctic with climate change. So as we invest in these ecosystems, we're going to invest in the west where we've got water. It's going to get harder in the east. You know, places like Cape Sanctuary, two years in a row we've had to go out and and, and find hoo-hoo grubs, whatever, to feed the Kiwis there. And when we get places like the Next Foundation, who are Neil and Annette Plowman are putting 100 million of their own money into step change in terms of environmental education, they're very, very careful with their investments. And they're actually wanting to secure investments for nature that are going to be here for, for our generations beyond us. So. It's an exciting time, it's a movement. As uh, Richard Branson said when he, when he heard about Predator Free, this could be the Noah's Ark of the world and it's really about putting nature at the centre of our economy. Kira.